Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Instead, they say, hey, which of us do you think is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? It's like a regular discussion among the disciples. And, and again, we see the glory of Jesus shining out. We see, well, we see what's inside a man as Jesus begins to expose their hearts. And as he does that, well, he does the same for us. Today we have part two of Pastor Sam's message, Transfigured and Tried. Lots of good stuff today as we begin in Luke 9, verse 37, after Jesus, Peter, John, and James have come down from the mountaintop where Jesus was transfigured. Now we'll be considering Jesus healing a man's only son, Jesus predicting his death, again, and the discussion of which disciple will be the greatest, and much more. So let's listen in as we go through the end of chapter 9. The next day, verse 37b, when they had come down from the mountain, a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cries out saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only son, my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him. He suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so he foams at the mouth. It departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast him out, but they could not. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I bear with you or be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child and gave him back to the father. The situation could not be more desperate. Another demon-possessed person, this time a child or a young man, a broken-hearted father, a group of impotent disciples. These guys had been empowered and sent out and had been successful in casting out demons and healing disease and, and ministering to every possible need, preaching the gospel in the process. But here they're unable to function, unable to succeed, and, and they do ask Jesus later. It's not recorded here for us, but it's oh so important. They ask him when they get alone with him, why weren't we able to cast him out? And he says, this kind goes out only by fasting and prayer. Take note of two things. Jesus doesn't say, well, I'm going to have to have a prayer meeting here and fast and get ready. No, he was always praying. He was always fasting. He was always ready. And we can be so caught up in just the day to day, the mundaneness of our lives that that we forget we're engaged in a spiritual battle. And for the enemy, it's full time, 24 seven. It's like the news cycle. It never stops. But here's the thing. Jesus is able to do what they can't do. His presence brings hope, his power help. The demon is cast out, the boy is healed, the family's restored. And the response of the people, they were all amazed at the majesty of God. Now, Jesus doesn't want his disciples getting caught up in the excitement of the moment. And they had a tendency to do that, as we, of course, do as well. So while everyone was marveling at these things, which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, we read it earlier, now you have the context, verse 44, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. Did they get it? No, they didn't. Because the very next verse says they did not understand the saying, and it was hidden from them, so they did not perceive it. And we're afraid to ask him about this saying. Now, here's an irony, and it's the first of many. As he speaks about a coming betrayal, something that should have really been troubling them, they should have been trying to process that. Instead, they say, hey, which of us do you think is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? It's like a regular discussion among the disciples. And, and again, we see the glory of Jesus shining out. We see, well... We see what's inside a man as Jesus begins to expose their hearts. And as he does that, well, he does the same for us. We can see that, that it's common to us to want to achieve, to succeed, and, and not just to do it for ourselves or for our family, but to be thought highly of or regarded or respected by others, our peers. So, so that's what they're dealing with. Now, as this dispute among them 
And it says dispute. They weren't just discussing it. They were debating it. I'm sure Peter, James, and John thought, hey, we definitely have the heads up. I mean, we were there on the mount. We were with them. We saw the glory. And well, in any case, the dispute arose among them as to which would be the greatest. Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child, set him by him and said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me, for he who is least among you will be great. Now, here's the interesting picture that I get anyway. Jesus, incredible patience. He doesn't rebuke them for wanting to be great. I think God has built into us a desire to achieve, to succeed, to do something meaningful with our lives. So he doesn't say, I can't have you looking to be great. No, he's like, let me tell you what greatness really is. He simply redefines greatness and tries to redirect their energies toward pursuing something that will actually please him and bless others. He basically says the last, the least, the servant of all will end up being the greatest of all. The key word as you go through his various teachings regarding how we see one another is the word others. To esteem others greater than yourselves. To watch out for the needs of one another. In fact, at one time, years and years ago, decades ago now, young Christian decided to make some posters. You know, back then you had to make them because they weren't making them for you. But, uh, but I, I took... Every time the Bible said one another and I made this poster with all of those one another's and all the scriptures that that uh, went with it. And I just put it on my wall. So every day when I got up, I could look at that and see love one another, you know, esteem one another and and care for one another. And and it's just on and on and on. There are quite a few one another's, by the way. And the point is this. That's what Jesus is trying to teach them, what he's trying to teach us. Does he mind that we're ambitious? Not at all. But he wants us to put our ambition in a direction that will be useful and fruitful, that we won't look back and say, man, I sure expended a lot of energy for what? Stuff? For, for position? For power? For respect? When, when no one in the end will really care. But, but you do what he says. You'll stand before him and hear, well done. Enter in. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, I believe you're going to hear that either way. I just think you'll believe it if you've actually done something to deserve it. But in any case, John answers because it's not all over. Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus says to them, do not forbid him. For he who is not against us is on our side. Here's another irony. Now, given that John was on the mountaintop with Peter, James, and, and, uh, and, and you know, what, well, the, 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 they're up there. He can't be with Peter, James, and John. That's why I started to say, but then I realized, hey, he is John. So he's just with the other ones. But he's been up there and the disciples have been un unable to cast out a demon. Now they're upset that someone's succeeding in what they're failing in. So they're not only competitive. I mean, they're competitive to a fault. They're jealous. They're envious. And, and here's, here's their response. Very much like they're going to get from the religious leaders. They're like, cease and desist. Stop. Who gave you this authority? I mean, you're not one of us. So what do you think you're doing out there? Casting out demons in Jesus' name. Well, here's an interesting response to all that. John the Baptist, when he had a similar situation, his disciples were leaving and going to Jesus. Some were still hanging. And they came and said, hey, we're losing a, the crowds, man. They're going over to Jesus. John said, he must increase and I must decrease. Now, apparently these disciples never got that memo because they're not really, uh, you know, into the decrease me and increase them thing. Now, I like how Jesus deals with this issue. First of all, he explains to them what they're missing. There's only one team here and it's his team. Now, they're the disciples. They're the apostles. They're his A team. But he's saying there's the, the light, there's love, there's truth, there's, there's me and my guys. And then there's darkness and deception and, and, and death and, and, and the devil. And, and so basically he's just saying, look, there's only really this team 
or that team. And, and, and so if they're not on that team, they're on our team. We're all in this together. And, and I think if we could see that, well, it would just lighten a lot of the discussions and debates over how people do things or do they worship or dress or, you know, function the way we do. And is this the best way to do it? In the first century, it played out like this. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. Paul's response to that is you're just a bunch of babies. You're just immature and carnal. In the 21st century, it plays out like this. I'm Catholic or Protestant. I'm Lutheran or Baptist. I'm Pentecostal or non-denominational. And, and, and here's the thing. Paul would say the same thing to us that he said to them. Just carnal, immature. It's like, you know, you were in junior high and then you were in high school. And if you grew up and went to high school here, I didn't. But I happen to know that if you went to PV, of course, PV is way better than Chico. Unless, of course, you went to Chico High, then Chico High is way better than PV. And, of course, you went to Paradise High or Durham. You know, who's talking about Chico, you know? And so the point is it's just carnality and immaturity, and we're all guilty of it. We all do it to some extent. And so I think what's happening here is he's exposing them. He sees their competitiveness. He says, OK, I built that in you, but I need to redirect it. It's not the best, the way you guys are seeing things. And now he sees that, hey, if you're not with us, no, they are with us. There's just his team and then there's the enemy's team. And now we come to yet a third issue. And, and by the way, one of the things Jesus does to deal with this issue of, hey, what about us or it's all about us? Very first verse of chapter 10, we'll look at it next time, but it's a little preview he sends out 70 people, anoints and empowers them to do the very same thing he sent the 12 to do. Well, what does that say? It's not just you guys. I had 70 guys over here and they can do what you're doing. Why? Because it was really about Jesus and it's always about him. Well, it came to pass, verse 51, when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. They're in the north, by the way. They're heading south. They need to go through Samaria or they need to cross the Jordan and come around Perea. So they're taking this shortcut through. As they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire? to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did before we read Jesus' response. Remember, they just saw Elijah on the mountain. And I'm thinking James looks at John and, you know, they're, they're brothers. And he's like, you thinking what I'm thinking? And like, absolutely, let's ask him. And it's like, Lord, could you just give the word and we'll call fire down and we'll teach these guys to diss us, Lord. I mean, you, Lord. And, and, uh, but, but, but he turns and rebukes them, verse 55, and says, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Here's why this is so important. We look at people and we judge them by what we see and hear from them. And we can look at some people and say, there's no way that person will ever serve the Lord. There's no way that person will ever be a Christian. You know what the Lord sees? He says, man, that guy is filled with zeal and enthusiasm. Dangerous, yes. Deadly, yes. But I can transform and use that guy. Such will be the case with the Apostle Paul. He's known as Saul of Tarsus. Again, you read the book of Acts and you'll see that God gets a hold of this guy that they were afraid of because he was actually going from city to city, arresting Christians, bringing them back to stand trial and voting for them to be put to death. That's Saul. But God says, hey, I'm going to use this guy. And years ago, decades now, I remember Greg Laurie saying, when you throw a, a rock in a pack of dogs, the one that barks loudest is the one that got hit. Well, what does that mean? It means the guy who's in your face and aggressive and intense, it's like, He's getting hit, you see. You're simply sharing the Lord. You're simply sharing his love. You're sharing his plan. And the one who's aggressively and antagonistically against it. Hey, if God gets a hold of that guy, he's going to use him mightily. Now, here's the other exciting thing. We look at one another and think, man, 
well, we should just look at ourselves and, and be honest. Hey, I've got so far to go, but I'm so grateful for how far God's brought me. But we tend to look at one another and say, how long is it going to take? I mean, attitudes need to change. Actions need to change. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and so again, Jesus has been discipling these guys personally. Have they changed? Yes. Are they still dangerous? Absolutely. Will they be in the future? No. How long will it take? We don't know. But I do know this. Read 1 John. And you will be amazed, shocked, blown away by how different John, the aged apostle who writes 1 John is from the guy who's here asking for power, for permission to destroy people that Jesus loved and came to save. Now, long-standing rifts, Samaritans repopulated uh, by the Assyrians after they were the group that was brought into the land from other lands, intermarried with the people in the northern kingdom of Israel. Later, the southern kingdom is taken to Babylon. They come back, they're pure-blooded. So they look at these guys up there. They think the Gentiles are bad, but these are half-breeds. They're worse than Gentiles. So, you know, when people people think like that about you or say things like that, well, you're not going to be all that fond of them either, are you? So the Jews hate the Samaritans. The Samaritans return that favor. And, uh, and so, you know, I bring this to your attention because this wasn't as personal as it seemed. It wasn't like they singled Jesus out and said, no, we don't want him coming. They don't want any Jews passing through their territory because they were despised by the Jews. But Jesus has a heart for the Samaritans. And even after this event, they just go to another village. And later, radical, wonderful things. Lots of Samaritans come to the Lord. And in the same way that he'll send the 70 to show the 12, it's not about you. It's about me. It's about the gospel. It's about others. It's about them. In chapter 10, he'll tell the parable of the good Samaritan. What's he doing? I think he's listening to them and, and he's really connecting with what's wrong with them, what needs to change in them. And then he's, he's fashioning what happens and what he does to, to teach them in a way that they can see it. And again, if you're a parent, you want to learn from that. You want to pay close attention to what you're hearing, not just say, I don't want to hear that again. You need to think about what you just heard and think, what do I need to teach this kid so that he won't think like that? So he won't, not just so I can get him not to say it, because you can get him not to say it in your presence, what's going to happen when he's not at home or she's not at home. It's all about teaching them as Jesus is teaching his disciples, discipling them so that, that they think right and respond right so that they're a blessing and, and not a problem. Well, one last thing as it relates to these guys, I'm wondering what happened to that you know, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, or maybe they'd forgotten. Jesus said, hey, love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Clearly, he sees there's a big gap between what he was teaching them and how they were still thinking and living and responding. And there's a gap in us too. Some want to say, oh, that's all hypocrisy. Not necessarily. It just takes time to change. I don't want to use that as an excuse, nor should you. But there needs to be a transformation and it happens as he transforms us by the renewing of our minds. First, he changes how we think and then it'll change how we speak and how we act. And his rebuke, his reminder will be reinforced again by the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, we conclude with three men who say they want to follow Jesus. And it's interesting because, well, that's what we've all said, isn't it? I want to follow Jesus. I, I want to be like Jesus. I want to please my Lord. He died for me. I'll live for him. He suffered for me. I I'll serve any and all for him. Verse 57, the first. It happened as they journeyed on the road. Someone said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It's Jesus saying, hey, I don't even have a place to stay. Is he complaining? Not at all. He's just saying, you need to really think about what you're saying. You need to count the cost. And if you haven't yet decided to follow Jesus, listen, I don't want to talk you out of following him. I want to encourage you to surrender your life to him. But you need to count the cost. Because what he's saying here is, is you're going to have to 
decide that, that your comfort and your this and your ambitions and your desires and your everything, it's going to have to be backburnered and put away for you to really follow him. You're going to have to truly follow if you say, I want to follow. And we don't want to be like those in the parable of the sower who hear and all excited. And, and then when tribulation or persecution or trial come, they fall away. And, and that's what he wants to make sure doesn't happen to this guy. That's why he says, count the cost. Then in verse 59, he says to another, follow me. Now, this is what he said to Andrew, to Peter, to James, to John, to Matthew, and they forsook all and followed him. Here's a guy who's willing, but he says, Lord, let me first, and that word first is the key word here, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now, lest you think Jesus is being cruel, let me assure you, dad's not dead. And, and that, well, it has a couple implications. One is he's going to resist this burial. I mean, it's just not going to go that easy. And, and, and so here, here's the thing. What's he really saying? Let me secure my inheritance. Burying your dad was necessary for you to inherit your inheritance. And he knows if he just takes off now, he could be written out of the inheritance. And so he's saying, I want to follow you. I will follow you. But first, I need to secure my inheritance. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not going to work out. There's other people that take care of that. Let them have it. You follow me. And if you follow him, there's some further instructions. Preach the kingdom of God. Now, that phrase is equated throughout this Gospel with the gospel itself. You preach the good news of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, that the king has come, that he will be back to rule and reign, but he came to suffer and die. Well, this guy's unwilling to trade an earthly inheritance for a heavenly one. And, and again, it's a call to count the cost. Finally, in verse 61, Lord, I will follow you, this third guy says, but... And you know that word doesn't belong. It's just, I'll follow you. Okay. Let me first go and bid them farewell who were at my house. And Jesus said, no one having put in his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Listen, Jesus loves you and he loves your family. He wants you to serve and, and experience him to the fullest. And he wants your family to experience that too. But we don't come to him in a group or as a family. We come to him as individuals. Again, in Acts, there are places where a man will get saved and then his whole family joins him. But every person stands before God as an individual. And it's so important to see this because if if I had waited to see if my family felt it made sense for me to give my life to the Lord, I guarantee you not one of them would have said, yeah, let's, uh, that makes sense to us. Even after I gave my life to the Lord, they're like, that makes no sense to us. But I decided I would follow Jesus at all cost. Whether they understood, whether they approved or affirmed, whether they came as well. The good news is many of them have come. Many of them chose to follow, not me, but Jesus. And, and so the point is this. In every case, it's about counting the cost. You may have to leave behind everything. To some, he says, leave it all and follow me. To others, he says, hey, use it all to glorify me. But either way, follow me. To some, he says, say, you know, let them take care of the temporal. Let them worry about the inheritance. You preach the gospel. You preach the kingdom. And finally, to this one, he says, hey, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Today we considered the disciples talking about which of them will be the greatest. And as Pastor Sam pointed out, it's not the only time they're going to talk about it. Well, what can you and I take away from this? Frankly, quite a bit, but here's what I would like you to see. You might be surprised at how men who walked so closely with Jesus and spent so much time with him could develop such attitudes. Well, don't be shocked. Jeremiah 17.9 asks us a question. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, the answer is only God can know it. And only God can permanently change it. One of the first steps of humility we take and must take is realizing our condition outside of Christ. And remember what the Apostle Paul told us in Romans 12:3, where he said, For us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but to think soberly. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.